have a new computer and I am um, learning this thing. So all of you who have had computers and tried to go through this, you know it is a learning phase. So uh, we'll try to have you some pretty Christmas music as you're coming in next Sunday. But we're so glad you're here. Um, we have a good number this morning. And before we get into the announcements, I want to say welcome back, Sharon. Sharon Snyder is back with us. <laughs> Sharon, of course, had shoulder surgery, and she is uh, recovering nicely, and uh, she is a one-armed uh, videographer back there this morning. But Sharon, we love having you back this morning. All right, let's take a look at our announcements. We have several things coming up for December. And uh, we're going to start off with our church committee meeting on the 12th. And this church committee meeting, as all are, are open to all of you. So any of you who want to come and attend and uh, see the kind of behind the scenes of how our church functions and decisions that are made, we welcome you. That is going to be on the 12th at 7 p.m. in the activity hall. Then on the 19th, we're going to have our Christmas caroling at 7 o'clock. It will be in front of the gazebo this year. We're going to just kind of be a stationary choir singing. We're going to be uh, some of you who want to join us in the choir lineup and then bring your golf carts and, and your uh, chairs. It'll be a remembrance of what we did a few years ago with our golf carts out here in front on Sunday mornings. And then also Easter sunrise, we've always done that at the gazebo. So come and join us and sing. We're going to have have some wonderful good old Christmas songs to sing. And then on the 24th is our uh, Christmas Eve candlelight service. It'll be 7 o'clock here at the clubhouse. And Pastor Allen and his wife will also be here to join in our celebration of the Christ child with our candles that we light um, and singing Silent Night. Um, and then on the 25th, we're going to do something a little bit different this year. We're going to be meeting for our Sunday morning Christmas service at the gazebo again in front of the nativity. That will be at 930. So again, you can come in golf carts. You can bring your chairs. Um, this, the reason for this, yes, honey, I'm getting, I was just right on the cusp of that. It, <laughs> he, you know. He's dangerous over there without the mic, so give him the mic and look out. Because, um, twofold. Um, one, they are going to be having the Christmas dinner here on that day, on Sunday. And that's kind of what prompted us to think about what do, would we want to do on Sunday morning. They're going to be in and out of that kitchen on Sunday to prepare for our Christmas dinner, for our community dinner. And so trying to be uh, just good neighbors, and trying to work with the community on something like this, uh, we said, okay, what could we do different than for our church service? We can still have a church service, um, not in this building, but we have other places. So that's where we're going to be meeting down at the gazebo. So please come on that Christmas day and join us for our Christmas service there. The word for you today, our devotionals are back in the back and they are going like hotcakes and that just makes me happy because we want you to enjoy those devotionals. If we need more, we'll get more. But please take our devotionals that we have back there for you today. Help Wanted. We need some readers for Advent Sundays. I don't think, I didn't check the list just before we started, but I don't think we have anyone, Lois, for the next couple Sundays. So if you would like to go ahead and read and light the candle, and you usually do it in pairs. So if you're single, grab someone else to do it with you, couples. We enjoy having that shared by couples in our church. So please do that. And then audio-visual, Jeff and I are still doing our thing up here. Sharon, as you know, while Sharon was gone, Jeff was in the back kind of doing the video. We really could use um, any one of you that says, you know, I've, I'm not a real techie necessarily, but I can support you in trying to come up and help us on Sunday mornings, get set up, run the computer if I'm up here and Jeff might be there or wherever. So if you have that kind of a talent, please see Jeff or me and we'll see if we can do that or Sharon. And then also, we still need our um, greeters and our ushers to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. And special music. If you have a, a talent that you would like to share, if you feel God has placed that on your heart, we all have gifts, we all have talents, but if you have a gift of special music, please see me 
And uh, we would love to have you sing for us on a Sunday morning. We used to have a choir, but right now we do not. We miss that special music by the choir. And so please come and offer the gift that God has given you. All right, I think that is all of our announcements. Have I missed anything? Anyone need to add? All right, we do not. Let's go ahead and proceed. Let's prepare our hearts as we come to worship God. That's why we're here, to worship him and to praise him. Dennis is going to lead us in our music accompaniment today. Dennis, would you start the prelude for us? Thank you. Well, as we gather this morning, I'll give you a welcome and hope all has gone well with you this week as we've gathered together to worship once again. As your pastor, I, I'm called at times to warn people about certain things, and so I must give you a warning today. There are 20 shopping days left. Oh boy, get ready. That's right. That's right. If, if, if 27 could not be busier than that is now, right? I mean, my goodness. Okay. Hey, it is good to see everyone to worship today. Let us go to the Lord and open prayer and go at that time. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Fathers, our hearts have now turned from thanksgiving to um, the Christ child. What a wonderful gift that you did give us. A gift of grace, a gift of salvation, a gift of your son. And so, Lord, as we um, worship you today, may we remember that great gift. May we be thankful for all that you do for us and all that you give to us. Be with us in this service and each aspect of it. May it, may it be a part that touches us in a certain way. May we go home differently because we have been here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we light the candle of Advent, the purple candle. She told me that three times. <laughs> the second purple candle. Last week we lit the candle of hope. We will relight that candle and we will light the candle for the second Sunday of Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. We will read from the prophet Isaiah and the apostle John. First from Isaiah. 
the voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is Isaiah 43 through 5. The words of Jesus from the Gospel of John. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. John 14, verse 27. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and in the countries of our world. Help us see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. Thank you, Christine and Lois. That was beautifully done thank you I love that British accent I love that all right we are going to begin our singing as a congregation this morning and now I know you all know this and so I expect some big voices coming from all of you today oh come all you faithful will you stand if you can and we're going to sing all three verses <laughs> Come on. 
beautiful singing. If you remain standing, you can turn to the back of your books, or if you want to look at our screen for the Apostles' Creed, if we, we could all read this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to our time of prayer this morning for our congregational time. And um, I've had several prayer lists given to me as well as the ones that we already have on the back of our bulletin here. Um, Don Elliott is home from the hospital, but he's still um, asking for prayer. So can remember Don during this time. Margaret Fowler, if I understand, she was the pastor's wife mm -hmm. uh, who was here for many years. And so um, she's having surgery tomorrow. And so please pray in her prayer. Ron Graham is undergoing tests in Ohio. <coughs> and so we we'll remember that as well. And Dixie Latham mm -hmm. is recovering from surgery in Ohio as well. You see the other requests that we have here, Betty Kersey and Sharon Snyder, um, and also the family of um, Laverne T Tiani, and so can them as well in prayer as we come, as we go to the Lord in prayer during that time as well. So let's, um, if there's no other prayer requests, let's go to the, oh, yes. Tony. Okay, Tony Pierce. Okay. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. Father, what a privilege it is to know that we have access to you at any time, at the hour of the day, that we can come to you and we can pray and we can know that you have given us that ability, that gift of prayer. And so, Father, as we come here today, we lift up many of our friends. We lift up those who are grieving at the loss of loved ones. We lift up those who are facing tests and those who are recovering from tests. We know, Father, that you are the great physician and that in each one of these situations, your hand is guiding the doctors, the nurses, the technicians in those rooms. And we know, Father, we're so thankful that we are wonderfully made and yet you've given men and women the ability to um, heal our physical bodies. But Father, what's more important than our physical bodies are our spiritual bodies and we just thank you that you've made that way for us as well that you've healed our sin sickness, that you've healed us in such a way that we can be, see you one day face to face, and we praise your name for that. So, Father, as we continue our service this morning, we would ask that you continue to bless our time together, that you would continue to keep us safe, that you would keep us mindful of this season and what is happening. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> we come now to our, um, our offering time and ask the ushers at this time if they would come forward. <coughs> Stand with me as we sing the doxology, please. Peace, 
Father God, we thank you for these gifts. These gifts come from general, generous hands and generous hearts. And Father, they remind us that you gave first. For he says in your word, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so, Father, as we come today, use these gifts in such a way to impact your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. As is the custom of our church, we have communion on the first Sunday of worship, and so I'd ask that you prepare that by um, removing your cell phone there on your cups, and, your, and you come together at that point. Before we partake, let me give you a couple of thoughts um, about communion just for a moment. It's called the, in some, some of our faith traditions, it's called the Holy Eucharist, in others it's called just the Eucharist. It's called the Lord's Supper, and it's called the Last Supper, and it's called communion. It's called a bunch of different things, but it has one purpose, to draw us back to Jesus, to draw us back to Jesus. And that's what we see in Matthew's Gospel, the 26th chapter, when Jesus, when we read these words from Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus ate, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, take and eat, this is my body. Given to then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered them to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This blood is the new covenant which is poured out for me for the forgiveness of sins. So as we take this bread, let's remind us of the body that walked on the streets of Jerusalem and Israel, that we may remember this salvation that he gives to us. And as we drink today, let us remember the blood that was poured to cover our sins, each and every one of us today. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you for this time. This time is so special to us. Father, in all of our faith traditions, we have different names for this, but it does remind us that it calls us back one more time to your Son. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Johnny desperately wanted a bicycle for Christmas, and so he asked his, Chris, asked his mom and dad if he could have a bicycle for Christmas. And however, his parents wanted Johnny to learn the importance of prayer, and so they suggested that he should write a letter to Jesus and pray for his bicycle. Not pleased with the response, Johnny had a temper tantrum, and his parents sent him off to his room. Well, once he was in the room, he decided to take his parents' advice, and he decided to write that letter to Jesus. And so the letter started this way, Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy this year and would love a new bicycle. Can you see if I can have this new bicycle? Your friend, Johnny. Now, Johnny knew that he had not been a very good boy all year, and, he had been, and so he ripped that letter apart and gave it another try. And he said, Dear Jesus, I've been an okay boy this year. I want a new bicycle. Yours truly, Johnny. Well, Johnny knew he wasn't totally honest again, so he tore up that letter. And he said, Dear Jesus, I thought about being a good boy this year, and I, I, I want a bicycle, Johnny. Then Johnny looked deep down in his heart, which, by the way, is what his parents wanted him to do, and he, he knew that he had been a bad boy and hoped that he would receive a bicycle just simply because Jesus loved him. And so he threw that letter away, and he went downstairs where his mother had a nativity scene wrapped in the fireplace mantle. And he took the statue of Mary, wrapped up in a blanket, and hid it under his bed. And then he wrote this next letter. Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, give me a bicycle. <laughs> <coughs> okay. 
Now, we have to admit, there are some people who do anything to get what they want for Christmas, right? Christmas is not about getting, though. Christmas is about getting what we need. That's the focus of Christmas. 2,000 years ago, God was using pinpoint accuracy to bring his plan into fruition to make a perfect plan for a perfect Christmas. In fact, Galatians 4 says, when the time was right, when everything was perfect, God sent his son. That's pretty amazing when you think about it in Galatians, the fourth chapter, because if I was God, and I am not, but if I was God, you would think you would send him during this time period, when we have instant communication, when we could spread the gospel everywhere. But do you realize, Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, that when things were perfect at that time, when people could relatively go from one city to another, from one country to another very easily, the gospel could spread such a way, it was perfect for him during that time. There was one, excuse me, there was one language. The Roman language, the Greek Latin was out there and people could speak one language. There was no confusion. And so Jesus came at the perfect time according to God's agenda. You know, we all want a perfect Christmas, do we not? A Christmas that is suitable for a Hallmark movie. A Christmas that warms the heart and refreshes the soul. But unfortunately, many of us will not have a perfect Christmas this year. The war in Ukraine has... Rob children, moms and dads, of a perfect Christmas at this time. Some will not have a perfect Christmas because of the economic reasons. Debts are mounting and they wonder, is there a way to see a light at the end of the tunnel? Others may experience a strained relationship and Christmas just reminds you it's a family time and somebody's going to have an empty chair at Christmas dinner. For others, it's the first Christmas without a loved one who has passed and that spouse or that daughter or that son or that mother, or that father, is not there this year. No one can always have a perfect Christmas. Maybe we should strive to have a right Christmas. And that should be our focus this year. And for there to be a right Christmas, there must be a right focus. Someone has coined the phrase, let's put Christ back into Christmas. And the truth of the matter is, it's been a while since Christ was the focus of Christmas. I read in 1594 that Christmas was canceled in New England in the community of Salem, because of too much frivolity and worldliness. This was 400 years ago. They said there was too much of this. And it was not reestablished for 23 years. Not much has changed the last 400 years, has it not? It seems like the more the parties, the more everything we go, we see the gifts, we see all that. And however, it may be simple, and you've heard it for years, Jesus really is the reason for the season. But is that true? Is that really true? Let's look at the text this morning and discover the true focus of Christmas as we gather here today. It's found in Matthew's Gospel. It's talked about the birth of Christ from Joseph's point of view. And he read these words. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. She will have given birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his, wi as his wife, but he had no union with her until they gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. For us to understand the right focus this morning, we have to understand that Christmas <coughs> is really about and Christmas is about salvation. To understand the Christmas story, one must not look at the Gospels that I've just read, but must look in the Garden of Eden, where man was experiencing perfect harmony, man and woman enjoying a fellowship with God the Creator. Yet in Genesis, the third chapter, harmony becomes chaos. Sin is introduced into the world by the serpent, bringing about changes in the relationship of God. And one word defines that change, separation. Moreover, separation brought several consequences. First, Adam and Eve would experience the aging process that would eventually lead to their death. In a perfect state, they knew no pain. Because, but because of sin, their bodies began to deteriorate and aging. Soft, supple skin 
would soon become ways would give way to wrinkles. Eyes would dim, hearing would become harder, and eventually death would come to all men as a result of sin. Second result of sin is all of creation would change. In the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, God has one phrase he uses over and over and over again. It is good. And over and over again, he uses those words. But once Adam sins, all of a sudden we discover everything is not good. Thorns and weeds grow next to flowers and, and fruits. Animals become territorial in what they're doing. And kingdom begins to go, rise up against one another, all because of sin. There's a third result, though, and that is God and man's relationship was severed. Before Adam and God, it says, would walk in the cool of the day. Can you imagine the conversations that happened each day during that time? God would meet his, his creation, Adam, and they would walk in the garden. I kind of get an idea that it might have gone like this. The two of them were walking side by side, and they would come to a giraffe, and, and, and he would say, you see that giraffe? And Adam would go, yeah, he says, I made that. <laughs> he said, I made that for you. These monkeys, this beautiful fruit, these waterfalls, these mountains, it's all for you, Adam. Every part of it is for you because I want you to be a servant in fellowship. And yet, because of sin, it all ended, and all of a sudden, everything began to change. The fourth result of sin was that of sacrifice. <coughs> sacrifice. After God had banished Adam and Eve from the garden, he replaced their leaf clothing. Remember, they, put, they used leaves to cover up their nakedness at that time. Well, God used, covered their, had covered their sin with, his, with, with animals. And an innocent animal had to die so that they had sin could be covered. Before Jesus was even coming into the world, God was cheating people right then that said, sin has to be covered not by plants, not by man, but it has to be covered by something else. A sacrifice must be made. And that's exactly what happened at that time. Thousands of years before Jesus was, was being born, God was giving us a preview of the Savior's life. Hebrews 1, I mean Matthew 1, 21 says, she will be, give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Listen, because he will save his people from their sins. We don't talk about that much about Christmas, do we? We kind of talk about the gifts, the presents, the food, the parties. But let us remember that the reason Jesus came is to have the focus on to cover our sins and to take, us, to take care of us at that point. Finally, the greatest separation had to be that of Jesus himself. Think about it. For the first time ever, God and the Son were separated because of sin. Sin compelled Jesus to go to earth as a baby, to grow up as a man, to face the cross. Our sin that would follow, allow God to allow the full extent of his love. Understanding when we say that Jesus is the reason for the season is partly true because technically we are the reason for the season. We are the reason Jesus came because he loved us for that point of view. So to have a right Christmas, we understand that it's different than just the gifts and the parties and the gatherings. It really is about us at this point and what God is doing for us at that time. But also to have a right focus, we have to understand that Christmas is about changing locations. Christmas is about changing locations. And every one of my ministries that I've had have gone from a youth pastor to a senior pastor to now working at a college. One thing has always been in common in any one of those moves, and that is calling up the U-Haul and moving my furniture and stuff. And it's a humbling feeling when you realize that your whole life is in 26 foot of cargo truck. Right? You think about all the stuff you gather, everything you get, everything you've got, you own, you can put in a 26 foot box truck. Wow. That really is kind of sobering at that time when you do that. And maybe when you moved, maybe came from Indiana or Illinois or Ohio, you did the same thing. And it's kind of sobering to realize that you follow that U-Haul truck, that everything you own is right there in that box truck. And it's all right there at that time. But why do you do that? Because you're changing locations. You're changing locations. Christmas is also a time when we, time, when we have God changing locations. Look at verse 23. The virgin shall be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's here. He's here. God with us. Max Lucado says, sometimes we lose the majesty of Christmas in the mundane. We see the gifts, 
We enjoy the season. We share with family and friends. We feel a little more generous this time of the year. But Lakato says, let's not lose the majesty of Christmas. Somehow, the God who created everything allowed his son to become a baby. The God who created everything allowed his son to become a baby. Think about it. The one who had unlimited power would now allow his son to become powerless in the form of a baby. The one who was clothed in majesty was wrapped in swaddling clothes. The one who walked the streets of heaven would now be born in a barn. The one who had no needs was now dependent on a young mother at that time. There are some words that really describe what was happening that first Christmas. Three words that describe that for us to help us have a right focus. That first word is that of humility. Before the birth of Christ, no royalty would ever show their humility. That would be too human, too common. Kings have parades, kings have entourages, kings, kings have announcements, and kings are, have heralds, and people looks and says, here is the king. We even see that in our own political system. When our president travels in a caravan of cars, or our governor travels in a caravan of cars, we see this great pomp and circumstance that happens during that time. And that's what we begin to focus on them and not what they're doing. When Queen Elizabeth traveled to Amer America for her last visit, she brought with her the following, the following items. 4,000 pounds of luggage, four outfits for every day she was in America, 40 pints of plasma, her own hairdresser, two valets, an official, sec official photographer, two personal secretaries, and two, <coughs> two personal secretaries, and the cost of her trip to America was $20 million. In meat contrast, God's visit to earth took place in the animal barn. No attendants were present. There was no one there to place the, there was no place to place the baby except they were in a feeding trough, thought to be a manger. In fact, the event that divided history and our calendars went unnoticed except for a few shepherds who came to visit. Why did God choose such humble means? God was teaching us at the first Christmas that regardless of your stature in life, you can accept his son as your savior. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for his sakes he became poor, so that you, through him, through his poverty, might become rich. He was humble in the way that he came. But he was also approachable. He was also approachable. Can, can you comprehend what it means for God is laying in a manger? To be so open? To be approachable? In the Old Testament, God was anything but approachable. When Moses came to the burning bush, what did God say? Take off your shoes, for this is holy ground at that point. The children of Israel understood the mountain of God was a place for rumbling and thunder and storms, and they refused to go to that such a place. Isaiah tells us that when he was brought into the throne room of God, he cried, Woe is me, I am undone, facing that he was going to see death because he had seen the Lord. The Jewish children knew the lessons well. Touch the Ark of the Covenant and you die. Enter into the holy of holy places without permission and you will never come out alive. However, on that first Christmas, what could be more approachable than a newborn baby? What could be more approachable than a newborn baby? Have you ever noticed how people react to babies? I mean, it, it's kind of funny what happens when a baby comes in the room it seems like everything changes, does it not? The baby becomes the center of attention. We want to touch. We want to talk. We even change our language, do we not? We lower our voices and we, because the baby is the center of attention. I wonder what it must have been like for the shepherds when they first arrived at Christmas. They arrive at the stable. They find no sentries, no guards. They certainly, nobody in, at the entrance. No one to announce their presence or to announce the presence of the king. Simply a father, a mother, and a baby waiting to see the world. That's all they saw during that time. C.S. Lewis says, Christmas is the time when the Son of God became men so that men may become the sons of God. Well, 4, years, it was, for thousands of years it was understood sinful man, the holy God, could not exist. But on that first Christmas, God was teaching us one, once again he was approachable in the form of a baby. Well, there's, there's a third word that just pops out from Scripture for us this morning, and it's the word of courage, the word of courage. Did you know how much courage it must have taken to display the first Christmas? How much courage must have been needed 
Think about it. Mary, she would give birth to the Christ child, having never known a man. Her only explanation, an angel told her these things. Now remember, God had not spoken for 400 years to the people of Israel. For 400 years, he had been silent. And now a young teenage woman, girl, is saying, I'm expecting a child, and I've never known a man. It took courage to be married, did it not? Well, what about Joseph? He would take care of Mary. He would make, his, he'd make her his wife. And he, too, only had the assurance of an angel that this was true and what he did. Joseph demonstrated courage by taking on, taking on Mary, regardless of public opinion or scandal. I wonder what it must have been like to walk the streets of Bethlehem and hear the whispers of the local hen party as they began to share, oh, there's that woman again, there's that, yeah, she says she met an angel. Come on, really? Tell us the truth, what really happened. And the same thing with Joseph. I can hear the old guys down at the bar going, come on, Joseph, tell us what happened, you know, over and over. But that's not what you find. What you find, the courage of two people who decided to be part of God's plan, and it changed the world forever. Aren't you glad that Joseph and Mary did not do what our country wants people to do with unwanted pregnancies today? Aren't you glad that Mary chose to be highly favored? Aren't you glad that Joseph was the one who said, I will take on the scandal, I will take her on, and I will, she will be my wife during that time? Friends, it is a right Christmas when we have the right focus. Mary and Joseph showed that right focus at that time. But you know, the most courageous person had to be Christ himself. Listen how Paul described the life of Jesus. Philippians 2 says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but himself made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I wonder what it must have been like for our Savior to have never have experienced hunger, never to have known pain, never to have known rejection, was now faced with hunger, was now faced with pain, and now faced with rejection. It took courage for Jesus to give it all up in heaven for us so we could be in heaven as well. You know, the Christmas carol, Away in the Manger, gives an idea that a manger is a safe place for a baby. But in truth, by becoming a baby, he exposed himself to all the frailties of a human, including that of death. And why did Jesus do that? Simply one reason. He simply loved us. He simply loved us. And that made it a right Christmas. I'm dreaming of a right Christmas. A right Christmas where we focus on Jesus, God's only Son, given for the ransom of our sins. A Christmas where we focus on a Savior who brings hope to every hopeless situation. A Christmas where we worship God, not the gifts under the tree. A Christmas where we focus on the King who demonstrated His humility, His approachability, and His courage. Christmas can only be right when you are right with God. And so this year, I hope over the next few weeks that you too are looking not for a perfect Christmas because I can't promise you a perfect Christmas. But I can tell you how to find a right Christmas. And when you find a right Christmas, you have a right focus and Jesus is the one who our focus should be. <coughs> Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this day. Father, as we sit in this room today, there are people who I know are not going to have a perfect Christmas. And you know their situations. I don't know them, but I know in a room this size, there are people whose Christmas will not be perfect. But Father, I pray that their Christmas will be right because they will focus on you and your son. When I think about the courage of Joseph and I think about the courage of Mary and the courage of your son himself who, who left the throne room of heaven to be born in a manger, all I can do is just stand in awe when I realize what you have done for us. And Father, there's nothing we can do that would even match that for you. And yet, you still love us in all that we do, in spite of our faults, in spite of our shortcomings. And so, Father, this year, 
may, may not be possible for a perfect Christmas for some, but may it be possible for all of us to have a right Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor, for those words. You know God came to earth, Jesus, as his son, Jesus, and he touched our lives in a way that, you know, can never be touched again, but will always be touched forever. There's a little chorus that um, I selected to end our service with. It's a Gaither song called, He Touched Me. Um, I hope you know it well enough to sing it strongly today. Again, it's only two verses in the chorus. So if you would listen to these words, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Isn't that the message of the gospel? Would you stand with me if you could, and let's sing this, and again, listen to these words as you sing them, and let them minister to your hearts. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer the same so good to be worshiping with you again today and I hope that um, this service has been meaningful to you in some way and some aspect of it as well. Um, so remember that as well. Next week we're going to look at a right pace. Okay, um, We're going to talk about the first Christmas rush and it's never gotten slower. Okay, So we'll find that out as well as we come together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for your son. Father, for the next 25 days we're going to have all kinds of things that will distract us from Christmas. But Father, today and from these next 25 days, may we focus on the important part of Christmas, of your Son. For this is our desire, this is our hope, this is what we want to do. So Father, help us put away all our distractions and help us focus on you and your Son during this season. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>